now this is uh, one of the question question three of total question number four and uh, we have one scenario we have a requirement let's focus on the requirement first so this is the requirement basically first requirement part one says explain with supporting calculations so there are two tasks explanation of the tax rule as well as some calculation tax capital gain tax implication for liber of the takeover of Vulcan limited by mercury plc on 1st june and then subsequent sale of his shares on 1st january 2023 so this is about takeover and uh, in takeover when someone take over another company then we have to allocate cost and then on subsequent sale we have to calculate gain or loss on disposal the second question is interesting it says explain again with supporting calculations why it would be beneficial to sell his shares on 1st may 2023 rather than on 1st january 2023 so it's quite obvious that uh, in case of uh, 1st january 2023 my tax year is 22 23 and in case of may 23 my tax year is 23 24 so it's all is about deferring something like this is one of the planning opportunity that uh, if you defer the uh, sale then you can get some more relief some more annual exemptions available so that uh, you can minimize your tax liability now keeping in mind this requirement Let's focus on the scenario. So here we have uh, the detail. Liber is UK resident and domicile, has taxable income of 30,000 each year. Liber acquisition of ordinary shares in Mercury PLC. So here we have this is the first acquisition. The so Liber purchased 800 ordinary shares, which is a 40% holding in Vulcan Limited for 14,000 on 1st July 2012. This is my first acquisition. Mercury PLC then acquired 100% share capital of Vulcan Limited on 1st June 2022. So this is basically takeover. And uh, what Vulcan Limited get against this? So LIBOR receive what? We have to see that. So LIBOR received four ordinary shares in Mercury PLC and 20 pound per share immediately after the takeover and uh, 15 pound cash against each shares. And the Mercury PLC has 200,000 ordinary shares. LIBOR has never been a director or employee of either Vulcan Limited or Mercury PLC. This is very important. The takeover was for bona fide commercial reason and not for the avoidance of tax. Now, afterward, Liber now wishes to sell all of his shares in Mercury PLC. He has received an offer from an unconnected person to purchase these shares on 1st January at a price of 28 per share. Liber would prefer to sell this share to his nephew. However, this would delay the sale as his nephew will not have the necessary funds until 1st May 2023. And Janus has said he will also pay 28 per shares. Now, as the question says that, explain with supporting calculations, the capital gain tax implication for LIBOR of the takeover and subsequent sale. So let's apply, I mean, word processor here so that first we can explain and then we can perform some necessary calculation against this so the rule says that first of all the 
it was written that it was for a bona fide commercial transaction. So the share for share exchange rule is applicable on takeover. Now, first of all, we have to write share for share exchange rule is applicable on the take over as this was a bona fide commercial transaction Now, we know that in case of share for share exchange or cash consideration, there is partial disposal, partial not disposal. So there is no disposal against share for share exchange and cash is treated as a part disposal. So this is the basic rule. And we need to calculate the calculation here. Now, let me perform some calculation and then I will insert this in the answer. So moving on to this. First of all, We have to perform some allocation and uh, let's perform some allocation here. Right. Let's perform it here. The, this is allocation of cost of shares. So what was the cost of shares initially? The cost has been given as What was the original cost? It was 14,000. So we need to split this 14,000. And uh, for that reason, we need to find out the ordinary shares that we receive. So ordinary shares we receive is uh, what? How many ordinary shares we received? We received uh, 800 ordinary shares. Four against this, and the price is 20. So this is the market value of ordinary shares. And we received some cash. How much cash we received? We received 15 pound per share, and we have 800 available. So that means uh, the total is we need to add value. What went wrong? We need to put value here and uh, this one plus. This one seventy six thousand. So now I need to split this on the basis of uh, how much fourteen thousand is related. So cost is cost is fourteen thousand, and it's related with uh, shares and cash component. With shares, you can say that uh, cost that is 14,000. And as far as the share cost is concerned, so it's 14,000 into 60. 
4,000 over 76,000. You will get the fraction that is uh, 11,789. And uh, for cash balance, you can find out the difference. And that difference is uh, roughly it's 2 to 1. So this is the allocation. Now, after allocation, we need to find out uh, that uh, what is the gain against sale of shares and what is the gain against the cash value. So, we have cash received that is 12,000 and the cost is we need to work out cost and that is the cost is the cost need to put minus here so this is 12,000 minus this and uh, this will give us a gain of nine seven eight nine so this is the first gain the second is the shares what is the value of shares disposed of twenty eight per share share has been disposed of at the price of twenty eight we need to find out the value of shares for its sale proceed. Sale proceed. And uh, how many shares now we have? 3200 multiplied by 28. So this is basically 28. 89,600 and uh, the cost is we have uh, this is the cost minus here so this is the gain and gain value is Seven seven eight double. So now we have total gain that is this gain is we have total gain and that is uh, this one plus this one. Total gain is 87,600 and uh, we need to apply annual exemption that is 12,300 and as a result we have taxable gain of 75,300. So this is the overall calculation side. Now let's insert in this particular graph. Now, so the chargeable gain against the cash component is that I have calculated 9789. Nine seven eight nine. Now, whether BADR is eligible or not, so the BADR is not 
available why what is the reason because liber is not an employee or direct Now, this calculation is in the Excel, so you can refer it. E. Now, the next thing the chargeable gain on disposal of shares is, and that is seven seven eight. Double one again, the Excel. So taxable gain is, or we can say that uh, the capital gain tax liability is. The capital gain tax payable or liability is so this is uh, how my taxable gain was seven five three hundred so it's uh, seven five three hundred multiply by Okay, I need to calculate here because um, we have already some income is there. Thirty thousand income is already available. So let's calculate it here. That uh, up to thirty-seven thousand seven hundred. That is the basic band. So what is the leftover amount is uh, 37,700 minus 30,000. 30,000 is a taxable income. So here, have. and this is based on 10% rate. So it's three four seven zero, and the re rest is the excess value is. So how much is now? It's uh, seventy five three hundred minus seven thousand seven hundred, and uh, now I have twenty percent rate. So. This is the excess one, and uh, total is now This is thirty thousand. So total is now one four two nine zero. This is payable. Hang on one minute.
my payable amount is let me correct it So this is the basically the theoretical discussion along with calculation. I've used both the documents, the word processor as well as the spreadsheet, spreadsheet for calculation, because this is the detailed calculation. So it's not good to solve this calculation on word processor. So now the second part relates to We have to identify the reason why it is beneficial to sell on 1st May rather than 1st January. The thing is that the gain will remain the same but sale took place in year 2324 rather than in year 2023. As a result, the gain against cash consideration, what was that? It was uh, the first gain was it was 9789. So is covered. To annual exemption, so there is no CGT table. Annual exemption is also available against gain on. Disposal of shares. Now, another calculation we need to perform. Here we can solve further. That gain, we already know that how much gain is there. So I can connect this here. So this is the game and now annual exemption and this is the uh, 12,300 so taxable game now now taxable gain is six five five double one and uh, TGT payable is uh, the same. TGT payable is same like uh, up to 7,700. We have 10%. Uh, the amount is same. And the uh, excess now is. Uh, The excess is the 
this minus 37,700. Rest is multiplied by 20%. So Now this calculation is uh, 7,700. So it's the uh, total now is one, two, three, double. This is uh, payable. So I can write here. So CGT payable is one, two, three, double, two, C. So this is what the answer, see the requirement again. First one was explain with supporting calculations the CGT implication for takeover and a subsequent sale of shares. And then why it is beneficial to sell his shares on 1st May instead of 1st Jan. Now we have to tell them the savings as well. So what is the saving now? So saving is, how much is the saving? So previously my total tax liability was 14290. So it's uh, 14290 and now it's 12322. So as a result, the overall saving is approx 1958. So this is the complete answer. So this was the part related with uh, merger and acquisition. And uh, as a result, the cash consideration is immediately taxable. And uh, the disposal of shares also took place in the same tax year. In the first example, it was in the same tax year. And in the second example, it was in the subsequent tax year. So we get one more 12,300 in exemption. And as a result, the overall saving is against uh, the annual exemption amount that is 12,300 into the savings amount. Now let's move to the remaining part of the relief. Now, we were discussing about some relief, some we have already discussed. In the previous discussion, I, I have discussed the rollover relief as well as the business asset disposal relief and uh, the gift relief, the holdover relief. Now, one relief is related with residential property. And that is called Principal Private Residence Relief. So in that relief, what we're going to, going to do is, if someone is having a residential house, a main residence, and he's occupying it throughout the tax year, then if it is uh, occupied throughout the life, then it is an exempt benefit. 
rest is if it is not occupied throughout the tax year so then we'll get some prr relief on that so let's discuss what is the rule of uh, prr relief so basically the principal private residence relief is available as this is the formula gain multiply by period of occupation for how many months you occupied the house divided by period of ownership important thing is you have to count the period of occupation out of period of ownership and this particular period of uh, occupation it involves two types of occupation one is the actual occupation and other is classified as deemed occupation so actual occupation means the person is uh, using that house and the deemed occupation is something different so in deemed occupation there are some rules which says that if someone is not using the house then still we can classify that person is having a deemed occupation so and this includes last Nine months always considered as deemed occupation, and uh, three years without any reason. Three years without any reason, no justification is needed, and uh, any period spent abroad due to employment, whether it might be anything. due to job and fourth one is up to 4 years in uk and due to this is due to job or business So the last nine months, three years without any reason, any period abroad, up to four years in UK due to job or business, is considered as period of deemed occupation. And remember that in this one, we need to have before and after. Actual occupation is must. Now, usually we have to count all the occupation before and after in order to calculate the principal private residence relief. And uh, there is one more thing in that, and that is uh, if during occupation. some letting is letting of house with the occupation partly occupied and partly let out so then letting relief is also available on the same property and uh, for letting relief the formula for letting relief is lr is the lower of one is fixed amount that is 40000 second is the gain exempted under prr the above value and third one is gain attributable to letting 
so we need to find out all these figures and then find out the lower of value this is possible when you have occupied the property and as well as you use that property as occupation and then let out for some period let's solve a basic example for that See this example. So we need to identify the total period of ownership and then total period of occupation. So on first May nineteen ninety six, Janet purchased the house for one lakh twenty five thousand. So this is the cost, one lakh twenty-five thousand. This is the date of acquisition, first May nineteen ninety-six. She sold this house on first Feb two zero two two for three lakh fifty thousand. The selling proceed is three lakh fifty thousand. We can calculate gain, selling price minus cost. And the date of disposal is first Feb two zero. So from first May nineteen ninety six to first Feb two zero, this is the total period of ownership. And uh, the total period of ownership is we'll calculate. Now see the occupation. So on first May nineteen ninety six, she lived in until she moved to a rented flat on first July nineteen ninety seven. So we need to prepare a table like this. This the chargeable period and the exempt one. So we'll start from the period that is first May nineteen ninety six. To first July nineteen ninety seven, first May ninety six to first July nineteen ninety seven, and this is the actual occupation. An actual occupation is exempt. So this is basically how many months? Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. And uh, we have uh, six months. So total is fourteen months. Afterwards, she remained in the flat until first October nineteen ninety nine, when she accepted a year's assignment to her firm's New York office. So up till first October nineteen ninety nine, she was absent from that property. So this period is without any reason. So without any reason, it is a deemed occupation. So now, from first July nineteen ninety seven to October nineteen ninety nine, if we count this period, that would be twenty seven months, and again exempt. Afterwards, she went to New York office, and she returned from this office on. First October two zero zero zero. From first October nineteen ninety nine to first October two thousand. So it's uh, like first October nineteen ninety nine to first October two thousand, and it's exactly twelve months, and uh, it's abroad, and due to employment. So it is exempt. And then she returned to UK and moved into a relative house where she stayed until she returned to her own home on thirty first January two zero zero one. So 
the next period is till 31st January 2021 and uh, it's 1st October 0, 31st January 2, 1. So it's October, November, December, January. So it's uh, without any reason again and without any reason is total three years. So this is four months again. Then she went back again and she stayed there on 31st January 2021. So from 31st January 21 to 1st July 2011. 1st July 2011. So this period is from January 2001 to July 2011. So that means we have uh, 2001, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So we have 10 complete. Uh, years and then we have uh, Jan, Feb, March, April, May, June. So this is the actual occupation and uh, if I'm not wrong, this is 125. This is actual occupation. Now afterwards, on 1st July, she moved in Newcastle and this is without any reason. She remained until she sold her house on 1st Feb 2022. So from 1st July 2021 to 1st Feb 2022. So it's 1st July 21 to First Fab two two. Now this includes one twenty seven months and nine months last is always exempt and the rest is one one eight and this is without any reason. So this is total chargeable period one one eight and this if we count this this becomes one ninety one and the total period is. Three zero nine months. Now, let's calculate the relief. Sale proceed. Sale proceed was three lakh fifty thousand. Cost was one lakh twenty five thousand. So we have gain. And this is two lakh twenty five thousand gain before relief, and then deduct the principal private residence relief, and this is two lakh twenty five thousand multiply by period of exemption out of total ownership, and this is going to be one thirty nine. 078 and the remaining is chargeable gain. So chargeable gain is the five nine two two. The difficult thing is that we need to count it carefully, and there are chances that we might have some miscalculation in the counting of the months. Now one more example with respect to the letting relief and then we'll move to the the relief 
I'll see this. So here the acquisition is 1st April 1996 and disposal is 31st March 2022. And uh, there is a gain given already 1,94,000. So we have a gain of 1,94,8,000 and then we'll discuss some relief. So from 1st April 1996 to 31st March 1998, this is the actual occupation. So let's prepare a table here that uh, chargeable amount and this is exempt. And we have first four ninety six, thirty first March ninety. And uh, now let's count how many months we have. So we have uh, seven months and three months. 97 so it's total 24 months and then subsequently we have 1498 to 30th september 2003 travels the world and led the house now, travels the world and led the house it, this means that the house is not occupied and then let out so means no letting relief in this part and this whole will be covered like uh, this is period of absence and this is without any reason so we need to count from 98 to 30th september 203 and it's total 66 months now the second phase is total 66 months and uh, 36 months without any reason is allowed and 30 is chargeable because total was 66 months without any reason. Next. So then lived in the house again as his private residence. So the next period is we have one zero two months this is actual occupation all exempt one zero two months now the tricky part is the last one this last period which is started from first april 12th to 31st march 22 and then if you count this it is uh, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. So it's uh, overall, it's 10 years, means 120 months. It's total 120 months. So this last period is total 120 months. And the last nine months is always examined. And the less uh, leftover is one one one. So live in two third and rented out one third. Now you basically know that in the last nine months we always get PRR. So that's why I deduct nine months. And now this one one one, the two third will get PRR, and one third will get letting leave, as per the rule. So the Two third is uh, becomes seventy four, and one third becomes thirty seven. Now let's put this here. 
we have two periods one is nine months another one is uh, 74 this is 37 and total is this is 67 this is uh, 245 and total is 312 now i have prr which is gain eligible and which has been given as in the question 194 800 multiply by period of exemption occupation divided by total as a result the prr relief is 23101 now we have to calculate lr and lr is lower of lower of what 40000 is the fixed value second one is the gain which we have calculated above and then gain attributable to letting so now we have to calculate gain attributable to letting so my letting period is this one this 37 is my letting period so 37 out of p12 multiply by the gain attributable to letting and the answer is okay this was the this was the prr 152968 and this was the gain attributable to let so a is 40000 PRR is 152968. Gain attributable to letting is 23101. So here lower of is considered as letting relief. This is the lower of value. Now, overall question says that we have gain before any relief. We have first relief that is PRR. And uh, that is 152968. And as we have letting along with occupation, so we have letting relief, and this is 23101. And as a result, the overall gain is 18731. So this is the chargeable gain value. So in short, a uh, bit tricky to calculate, but not uh, an impossible thing to do. But it's a very important relief and it's usually examinable. So we need to be careful about counting months against this. Now another relief, let's quickly do it. And that is called incorporation relief. Again, an easy one. It happens that when an individual transfer an unincorporated business, might be a sole trader business or a partnership to a company, when business transfer into a company, then this incorporation relief is available when an unincorporated business becomes an in, in, incorporated business. what is what is the implication so if there is any gain on unincorporated business so any gain is deferred till disposal of shares of the corporation whatever shares you received this is to be offset important thing is we need to understand the condition when this particular relief is possible one of the condition is the business is transferred as a going concern 
in going concern we have transferred the business all assets have been transferred other than cash transferred to that company second condition and the third condition condition is the consideration must be insured consideration must be in shares whether it's partly in shares or full in shares the consideration must have some components of shares and this relief is automatic you don't need to apply for that relief if this involves shares whether full or partial then it's an automatic relief now if 100% shares is there so in case of 100% shares what is the implication no chargeable gain all deferred and the market value of shares acquired is market value of business minus the deferred gain but sometime it happens that we are we receive partly for shares then some of the gain is immediately chargeable and some is deferred so how to calculate incorporation relief then so incorporation relief is now calculated as total gain on disposal of this business multiply by market value of shares consideration divided by market value of total consideration so this is going to be deferral and the rest will be chargeable there is one more possibility that even if you have the option to use this incorporation relief but you can also disapply this incorporation relief now why you will disapply this incorporation relief because it is a possibility that that if this is a chargeable amount then it might be covered against some other relief such as it might be covered against annual exemption then there is no need to defer this gain if it is covered against annual exemption it might be covered against brought forward losses brought forward capital losses or it might be covered under badr if badr is also available then there is no need to get this incorporation relief and you need to disapply so as it's an automatic elect uh, rule so election is needed for disapplying and you need to disapply by 31st january 2025 for the tax year 21 22 for this tax year you need to apply by 31st january this month so the thing is that when you uh, convert your unincorporated business into an incorporated one then first identify all the gains on every asset and then find out the net gain and then see 
how much shares you received if it is 100 percent no gain on no gain right now all the amount is deferred if it is partly cash partly share consideration then some amount is taxable and some amount is deferred 